the high frequency. Let me make sure I got audio. What's that sound? Sorry about that, y'all. I don't know what that sound is. So let's see if I can adjust it. See if they got rid of that high pitched noise. It did. All right, y'all. Give me a few more minutes. All right, this is Elvin Israel, one of the instructors of RPK, where we concentrate on resurrection, prophecy, and kingdom. This is our YouTube website. As you see, uh, we have a handful of subscribers, and we ask that you uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel to help increase the number. Please share the video, uh, share the YouTube channel, uh, and also hit the bell so you can get all uh, up to date videos that come out. Here we go, and uh, I'm Elvin Israel, you know.
Y'all know that we teach here at RPK that the Bible has been fulfilled. It was written for a, a time, a specific time, and in all prophecy in first century uh, AD era, same generation of Christ. So therefore, some of the stipulations inside of the scripture was used as a figurative or allegorical uh, measure in order to teach the children of Israel a special uh, lesson. And that's why, you know, we have the freedom here to uh, have our head coverings on and et cetera, because we understand the meaning behind it and we're not stuck in the carnality. So I have finished up my Genesis series. Uh, please check it out on the RPK channel. It was five uh, different videos breaking down Genesis 1 and it ended in the beginning of Genesis 2. So hopefully you all have a deeper understanding of what's going on. And don't forget, we teach here from the ancient Eastern mind. We try to get to it as close as possible. And the only way to get to it is to use the Bible as well as other ancient uh, uh, documentation left over by the Jews. Uh, you know, the Samaritans are those from the Northern Kingdom, the original Samaritans that, that went in Samaria, but those from the Northern Kingdom, we know that they did not leave a lot of literature behind. And so, uh, the Jews was the ones, which would be uh, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. They would be the ones that was more active into the covenant uh, that was given in Mount Sinai. So uh, they would be the one who left a lot of the literature behind, which we found in the Qumran caves and etc. Some of the things was written in the second century uh, AD era also. But we use those ancient documents, right? A little bit of the church fathers, not for prophecies, because we know the church fathers butchered the prophecies. But for the old ancient tradition of what was going on in Israel at the time, <clears throat> when they use it as a historical time statement, a time step, or historical information, then also we will listen to the uh, church fathers to say how Israel did things or how the old uh, Torah uh, worded their things compared to the Masoretic, what we have now. So that's why we, we use the church fathers for that, but not for prophecy. But 90, I would say 85% of our information is coming from uh, the community of the Jews. And we know that they looked at scriptures differently. Not all Jews looked at scriptures uh, the same way, but collectively they all had like a similar point behind these uh, mysterious texts. So we're here to try to teach uh, the overall information or lesson that Moses was trying to uh, give to the ancient Israelites in his days and how the first century viewed it and etc. Uh, we're not trying to put a, a westernized spin on it. We're not trying to tell you uh, our American version of what these scriptures mean because then you get far off from the truth and it's hard to come back from that. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to keep it in the historical reference as much as possible. So once again, you see the logo RPK, Resurrection, Prophecy, and Kingdom. You're welcome to come study with us anytime that you want to. All right. So today... We're going to start a new series. We're going to start the series uh, dealing with the feast days, right? And we're going to try to uh, dissect these feast days from all type of different perspectives so we can try to get a deeper understanding of what's going on in the feast days, okay? Because the one thing uh, people try to do, you know, they try to tell you that we still got to keep those feast days today inside of America in the 21st century, even though all of the elements that the ancient Jews had no longer is available to us today. They want to tell you, well, forget all of that stuff that you can't do and only concentrate on the things that you can do, which is nowhere, any part, in any commandment, ordinance, or statue that Moses left. Uh, that's something that we created in order to continue something that wasn't meant to be a continuation. Okay, uh, here we know we understand that the feast days themselves was meant to tell a story. It was meant to explain something to the children of Israel. And people got caught up in the festivities and not the point. So here we're going to try to go through some of the 
uh, meaning behind the feast days to show you how the feast days have been fulfilled and how we don't need a reminding of the fulfillment of those feast days through the uh, actively doing those feast days and how we're no longer under the bondage the, of having to do the feast days. And if you don't do the feast days, you are transgressing. We're no longer under that bondage, and we're going to prove it uh, in this series. But hopefully you learn a lot of information from this series that we're going to present. Let me make sure I have volume. Okay, I do have volume. So now, we're going to start off with the Passover, okay? And uh, I will let the scripture speak for itself. We're going to hit it from different angles. This is going to be... Feast Days, uh, Part 1, Series 1, Passover A. So, so I'm only going to do the layer or the top of the Passover today. And then on my next series dealing with the Passover, we're going to get into more details from different perspectives and etc. of what's going on in the Passover. And we're going to do the uh, spiritual significance of the Passover, uh, dealing with when did the last Passover occur. So, hope you all are ready to get into this information. Let's dive in. Okay. First of all, we're going to start in the book of Exodus, right? And today, I believe I'm going to use the Septuagint edition a.k.a. the Greek Codex that was translated into English today because it's a little earlier than the Masoretic or what we have in our King James Version Bible. So let's see. This is Eastward, a good biblical app. And you can download any uh, uh, Greek Codex, a.k.a. what they call the Septuagint, for free. All right, so we're going to start in Exodus Four, and we're going to get to where the feast pretty much was uh, uh, introduced a little bit. Let's see here. Okay, I think I got it from the Masoretic first. Oh, let me see here. Give me one sec, I'm looking for something. All right, sorry about that, you all. We're going to start in Exodus 5. All right, so look. This is how it's going to start off. Once again, we're going to be using the Septuagint, or the Greek codex that was translated into English, not the Masoretic. So this is how it starts off. Exodus 5 and 1. And after this went in Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh, and they said to him, These things say the Lord, God of Israel, send my people away, that they may keep a feast to me in the wilderness, right? So we have it right there. A feast to me in the wilderness. So let's see uh, what the word feast right there means, right? Feast, H2287. I said kagog. It means to move in a circle. That is specifically to march in the sacred uh, uh, procession, to observe a festival. By implication, to be giddy, to celebrate, to dance, to hold a feast or holiday, real to and from, right? So they're going out in uh, pretty much as a festivity, right? This is what the feast is right here. Pretty much a festivity. All right. So now, because all this is going to make sense why I read it, right? So now look what, what happened here. So 
uh, this is what uh, the uh, the Most High, uh, Yahweh, told Moses, right? And after this, went in Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh, and they said to him. So they were laying the message to Pharaoh that they got from Yahweh. These things say the Lord, God of Israel, which will be Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel. Remember, not God of the planet, this God of Israel. Send my people away that they may keep a feast to me in the wilderness, right? And Pharaoh said, who is he that I should hearken to his voice so that I should send away the children of Israel? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Verse 3, and they say to him, the God of the Hebrews, right? This is very important has called us to him. We will go, therefore, a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest at any time death or slaughter happen to us. So uh, sacrifice right there, right? To slaughter an animal, kill or offer to slay. Right? So, why? Because if they did not obey the, uh, Yahweh, everybody knew death meant death would occur when you did not hearken to the voice of Yahweh. And how do we know? We can even find this in uh, Exodus 4, right? Exodus 4, uh, 18. Moses was supposed to be in the covenant, right? He was supposed to be doing the covenant that was given to, to uh, Abraham, right? And what was the covenant? The covenant of circumcision, right? He, uh, in order to be in covenant with the Father, he had to go through that covenant of circumcision, right? Him as well as his offsprings. So then you see what happened. And Moses went and returned to Jothar, his father-in-law, and says, I will go and return to my brother in Egypt, and we will uh, see if they are yet living. And Jothar said to Moses, go in hell. And in those days after some time, the king of Egypt died. And the Lord said to Moses and Madian, Go depart into Egypt, for all that sought thy life are dead. And Moses took his wife and his children and mounted them on the beast and returned to Egypt. And Moses took the rod which he had from God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When thou goest and returnest to Egypt, see all the miracles I have charged thee with, thou shalt work before Pharaoh, and I will harden his heart, and he shall certainly not send away the people. And they shall say to Pharaoh, these things said the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. So now, what were you supposed to do? Uh, you offered up your, your firstborn. And but we're going to see that actually later on in Torah. But you see that Israel had a specific, uh, and the firstborn is the one to get the inheritance, right? All the inheritance is supposed to go to the firstborn. So in order for them to get the inheritance, they still had to be under the covenant, right? which we're going to see like uh, something similar. And I said to thee, send away my people that they may serve me now. So now notice that serve me was the same thing as the feast, feast serving him. Now, if thou would not send them away, I would slay thy firstborn son, right? And it come to pass that the angel of the Lord met him by the way in the end and sought to slay him. So now the angel, so look, so, they were supposed to hearken unto what well, Pharaoh was supposed to hearken unto the voice of Yahweh. And if, the, if they did not, if he did not hearken unto the voice of Yahweh, then the firstborn son was supposed to be slain, right? So now you got uh, Moses under this covenant. And they, under that covenant, they were supposed to be circumcised, right? So now Israel being the firstborn, that means that Moses was the firstborn as well as Moses' son was the firstborn, right? So all of them were supposed to be under covenant, right? But if they did not disobey, if they disobeyed the covenant, what was supposed to happen? They was going to be cast away or, or slain. So this is what's going on. And it came to pass that the angel of the Lord met him by the way in the end and sought to slay him. Who? Moses. And Sephora, having taken a stone, cut off the foreskin of her son. And fell at his feet and said, The blood of the circumcision of my son is touched. And he departed from him because she said, The blood of the circumcision of my son is touched. 
So Moses was spared due to his son being circumcised, right? Due to him putting his son inside of covenant, all symbolic for Israel getting inside of covenant and being saved, them getting life, not them uh, dying for them being out of covenant. So that's all what's symbolic was going on. But you see, uh, the Most High did not play, uh, Yahweh did not play if you disobey uh, his word, even with Moses. Moses could have got it too for his disobedience, right? So now, so this is what it says, lest any time death or slaughter happen to us, because he already prophesied that uh, the firstborn would die, uh, anybody not listening to him, right? So now, so what is what is the importance of here, right? Well, if you ask somebody now, right, right now in 2020, right, 21st century, if you talk to the people, they tell you that you got to do the sacrifice. I mean, well, you don't have to do the sacrifice. So they tell you Christ came to do away with the sacrificial system, but we got to keep the feast days. So I want you to look at the wording of what Moses did. Moses did a lot of double of talking. He'll say it one way, then he'll say it again another way. But I want you to look at the wording that Moses used, right? These are for my people that said Christ came to do away with the feast day. I mean, with the uh, sacrificial system, right? Look, the Most High called it first. He called it his servants, right? In Exodus four, he called it uh, may serve me or his servants, right? Exodus 5, they said that he called it a feast to me, right? So he was supposed, these are the words that the Most High was supposed to, uh, this was the words that Yahweh gave Moses and Aaron to tell, call, uh, to speak to the Pharaoh, right? So they tell, when they went to the Pharaoh, they said that they was going to keep a feast to Yahweh, right? But then as they progressed talking to Pharaoh, what did they call this feast? That we may sacrifice to the Lord, right? So now, the feast is equivalent to the sacrifice, right? Feast is equivalent to sacrifice. So you can't have a feast without sacrifices because they're equivalent. They pretty much mean the same thing. This is why up here, he said, keep a feast. And this is why down here, he said, we may sacrifice. They're talking about the same exact thing, just said it not only two, but three different ways. The first way, it was said, uh, may serve me or may serve him. The second way, it was called a feast. The third way, it was called a sacrifice. It's the same exact thing, just said differently, right? So now, you can't have a feast without a sacrifice. So if Christ came to do away with the sacrifices, he came to do away with the feast because they're the exact same thing. They equivalent, mean the exact same things. Like love and marriage, you can't have one without the other, uh, as the saying goes from uh, the theme song of, of uh, what was that, Al Bundy show, uh, Married with Children. So now, you got feast, sacrifice, same exact thing, equivalent. So Christ can't do away with the sacrifice and not do away with the feast. It's impossible. Hopefully we all got that now. We all understand it. So now, let's go down and shalom to everybody that's watching. So now, let's go uh, to Exodus 12 now. Once again, we're in the Septuagint. We're reading from the Greek perspective uh, that was translated into the English, which is a tad bit older than the Hebrew codexes that we have. All right, so now, we're going to go to Exodus 12, and let's see here. I'll, uh, I want to go through the, uh, the regular King James Version first and see how they work it. All right. And then I'm going to go back to the Septuagint because I like how they worded it in the King James Version. Then we're going to go right back to the Greek Codex. All right, so Exodus 12 and 11 from your regular King James Version, right? 
and thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, right? Your, uh, your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Okay, so now, this is where understanding how words work uh, comes in play. You see, when they translate it into English, right, they had Lord's apostrophe S Passover, which shows possession, right? It shows that the Passover belong to the Lord. Okay? So now, this is just like me. Let's just say your name is uh, Anthony, right? And you have a car. Anthony's car, right? Anthony's car is blue. Okay? So, the car belongs to Anthony. Not the people. The car belongs to Anthony. So now, this is the Lord's Passover, right? So now, let me show you the significance of that. The Passover belongs to the Lord. So we have established that. But what does that mean? The Passover itself is a story about the Lord. It's the Lord's action. The Passover is more like the autobiography of the Lord. So if you were to create a book, an autobiographical book, right, about the Lord, the book can be entitled Passover because it's all detailing the Lord, right? It belongs to the Lord. It's the Lord's story. Once again, remember we say the feast days is telling a story. People try to take it literal. They get so caught up in the food that they don't have the meaning. So the Lord's Passover, it's a story belonging to the Lord, about the Lord. So he was, in the beginning, Moses was trying to explain to Israel the things that was going to occur when the Messiah came. Okay. So now we can go into the Septuagint now. So now look. And thus shall ye eat it, your loins girded, and your sandals on your feet, and your staves in your hands. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is a Passover to the Lord. The Passover belonged to the Lord. It's all about the Lord. So now, we're going to go into detail to show you how this is actually a story about the Lord, okay? It's a story about the Lord, the Passover is. So now, let's start from the top now. And the Lord, let's start at one. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be to you the beginning of months. It is first to you among the months of the year. Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, let them take each man a lamb according to the house of their families, every man a lamb for his household. And if there be a few, and if there be few in a household, so that there is not enough for the lamb, he shall take with himself his neighbor that lives near to him, as to the number of souls. Every one according to that which suffices him shall make a reckoning for the lamb. So this is uh, community, right? This is the community helping each other, right? He should take with himself his neighbor with, that lives near him. So this is pretty much showing uh, neighborly love, right? A community. It shall be to you a lamb unblemished. A male of a year old, ye shall take it of the lambs and the kids. Right? So now, first thing to notice. Well, one of the first things to notice is, one of the requirements, it had to be a male. Right? It had to be of the male species. Could not have been a female. Of the male species. Right? 
to show the importance that man was created first, right? So this is showing uh, the importance of the male species uh, being symbolic for something. But we're going to, you know, we can go through that later. It shall be to you a lamb unblemished, right? A male of a year. You shall take it of the lambs and the kids, right? So now, what does this unblemished lamb that's a male represent, right? So now, let's just go through and show you how Moses enigmatically uh, ign spoke or how Moses used a lot of symbolism, right? So now, you have an unblemished lamb, which was a male, right? So now, once you go to Leviticus 21 and 21, let's listen here. Whoever of the seed of Aaron, the priest, has a blemish on him, shall not draw nigh to offer sacrifices to thy God, because he has a blemish on him. He shall not draw nigh to offer the gifts of God. So now you see that the priest had to be unblemished in order to do the servitude of God, right? So the priest, the priest could not have a blemish, a blemish, right? The priest could not have a blemish. So you have a male lamb that was unblemished. You had a male priest that had to be unblemished. The male lamb was to be a sacrifice. And the, the unblemished male lamb had to be was the sacrifice, was the part of the sacrificial services, him being the sacrifice, to Yahweh. So you have the priest being unblemished, doing the sacrificial service to Yahweh. So you can see that that lamb represented the priest. And the unblemishing of the lamb represented how the priest had to be unblemished, right? And if that don't, you know, if that don't suffice, right? You got 1 Peter 1. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me go to the KJP. 1 Peter 1 and 19. When we started uh, 18. For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spots. So now, you have Christ, right, being a lamb without blemish, without spots. So in the beginning for the Passover, one of the things they had to have was a lamb that was unblemished. We find out that the priest had to be unblemished without when they was doing services to the Most High. So now you have Christ being the high priest, being unblemished. So the lamb told a story of the priesthood, right? The lamb represented a story of the priesthood. A lamb had to be raised inside of the house, inside of the congregation of Israel. The priest raised inside the congregation of Israel. In order to do the services correctly, the, the, the lamb, and oh, sorry, in order to have a correct, uh, uh, uncorruptible sacrifice, the lamb had to be unblemished. In order for the priesthood to remain uncorruptible and for them to do the services of the Most High, they had to be unblemished. In order for Christ to be that perfect sacrifice, him being the high priest and the sacrifice, he had to be unblemished. So you see how that's twofold. He was an unblemished priest, and he came in as an unblemished lamb.
the lamb represented the sacrifice of the high priest, which was him himself. Okay? So now, let's go back to Exodus Exodus 12 and 6. So we got the lamb unblemished male, which represented the priest of being unblemished surfaces, right? So now, let's go to Exodus 12 and 6 now. Uh, Exodus 12 and 6. And it shall be kept by you till the 14th of this month. And all the multitude of the congregation of the children of Israel shall kill it toward evening. So now you have the lamb that's unblemished in the male, which represented the high priest, right? But now who had to kill the lamb? All the multitude of the congregation of the children of Israel. They was responsible for raising the lamb and then killing the lamb, right? So now, let's go to Luke 24. Let's read 18 through 20. Well, let's start at 17. This is when Christ came back, right? And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are saved? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, a Cleopas, answered, said unto him, answering, said unto him, Are thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not and hast not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, what things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a little prophet, sorry, which was a prophet mighty, I don't know where I got little from, which was a prophet mighty indeed and in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. So now, who did they say kill Christ, the high priest, a.k.a. the unblemished lamb? The chief priest and our rulers, right? So these are Israelites. These are the congregation of Israel, right? And I know people want these rulers to be uh, 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 Romans, right? But these are rulers inside of Israel. These are the Israelites, right? So we can go to Acts 4 and verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So now, who is he talking about? Uh, you go up to uh, verse 6. And Ananias the high priest, and Cephas, uh, Cephas, uh, however you say it, and jo uh, John and Alexander, and as many of were the kindred of the high priest were gathered together in, in Jerusalem. So these are Israelites. And when they had sat in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So the rulers of the people would have been the high priests and uh, Caiaphas and John. And so these would be the high priests and the kindred of the high priests, which would have been the regular priests and etc. Uh, and it says right here that their rulers and elders and scribes, right? So all of these would have been the people of Israel stock. So the rulers of the people were of Israel stock. These would have been the, the priests and the high priests and etc. So we see now in 
Luke 24 again. 18 through 20. That the chief priests and rulers, all of Israelite stock, delivered him to be condemned to death. So, and have crucified him. So, who killed the lamb? Israel. Right? Israel killed the lamb. Israel killed the lamb. Killed the high priest. Killed Christ, who represented who the lamb represented. The lamb represented Christ, right? Don't forget, it's telling a story. So Exodus 12, 6. The multitude of the congregation of the children of Israel shall kill it toward evening. So once again, you can see that this is only talking about what the story, this feast is actually talking about the life of Christ and what was supposed to happen to Christ. And they shall take of the blood and shall put it on the two door posts and on the lintel and in the houses in whithsoever they shall eat them. So now, what's happening? They're putting blood, right? And remember, this blood was put there to protect them from the death angel or the or the or that being that was going to bring death. So the blood that was uh, that came from the sacrifice of the lamb was going to be what redeemed Israel from death. Once again, the blood of the sacrifice of the lamb is what redeemed Israel from death. Right? So you got a uh, house Right? You got the blood put on the houses and on the two doorposts, right? So all of this is going to go together now. You got first Timothy three uh fifteen. Let's start at fourteen. These things write unto I unto thee. Hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So now, what was the house of God? The house of God was the church or the congregation, right? The house of God, let's look at the word church right there. Was the church, uh, ecclesia, ecclesia. It means derivative of a calling out, which they called them the called out ones. That is a meeting, especially a religious congregation, the synagogue or Christian community of members on earth or saints in heaven or both. It's an assembly or a church. It's a meeting place, right? The meeting place. So the places in which where they met in order to worship and to be in each other's company, right? That is the house of God. So not a literal building, but the place in which the people met up, that was the house of God. The people was the house of God. So now you got a house, right? The house is the people. So now let's go to Hebrews 9. I'm going to read 14 to 15. But we'll start at 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ? So now we have the blood of the lamb right here, right? The blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot. So that's the uh, unblemished lamb without spot to God. Purge your conscience. Remember, the church 
is the house of God. And now it's purging their mind, their conscience, from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament or covenant, that by which means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions, which was under the first covenant, uh, covenant or testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance, right? Then we go down to verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So now, you have Christ's blood, right, was used in order to uh, remit or remiss sins, right, or to get rid of sin, right? So what, you had to have a shedding of blood for atonement. You had to, right? But we see here that the house of God was the people, right? The people was the house of God. And the blood of Christ was used Un, the, un, the, unsplot, the unblemished, the spotless lamb's blood, which was Christ, was used upon the house, a.k.a. the people, mind, the people's mind, in order to purge their conscience, which is their mind, right? Let's look and see what the word conscience right there is. Let's see what the, the translators did. Conscience, a.k.a. Uh, sunodesis. Uh, co-perception, the moral consciousness, the conscious, right? So the things that they do that were good, a.k.a. the things in their mind, right? So he's purging their mind with his blood. And we know that the people themselves are the house. So when they put Exodus, let's go back to Exodus now. Exodus 12. And seven. When they took the blood of the lamb and put it on the two doorposts, right? They put it on the houses, right? It protected them from death. And when Christ, the unblemished lamb, made his sacrifice, his blood was put upon the house of God, which are the people in order to get them away from their dead works or death. This blood, this blood right here in Exodus 12 from the literal lamb uh, protected them from death. The blood from the spiritual lamb protected them from death. All right, so now let's go to Exodus 12 and 8. And they shall eat the flesh in the night Roasted a uh, roast with fire, and they shall eat unleavened bread with bitter herbs. And don't forget, this right here is the story of Christ. People, we got to keep understanding that this is the story of Christ and how Christ dealt with Israel. You cannot take that away. This is the story of Christ and how Christ dealt with Israel. This is Israel's redemption through the Lamb. This is all about how the Lamb was to redeem Israel. So now, they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire, and they shall eat unleavened bread with bitter herbs. Right? So then, we go to Psalms 68 22. Right here, here you go, 21 right here. Y'all know the Septuagint and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's different. But anyway, they gave me also gall for my food and made me drink vinegar for my thirst, right? 
made me, so he had to eat bitter herbs, right? If you don't know vinegar, vinegar is bitter, right? So he had, they had to eat vit, uh, uh, bitter herbs and unleavened bread, right? So now, let's go to, and we see here in Psalms, when David was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it made me drink vinegar for my thirst. They gave me gall for my food. It made me drink vinegar for my thirst, right? And you go to the uh, KJV now. Go to John 19, read 28-30. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So the last thing that they gave, uh, you got the vinegar, they're supposed to eat it with vinegar. I'm oh, sorry, they're supposed to eat it with unleavened bread and, and uh, bitter herbs. That represented the vinegar that the lamb partook in before it died, a.k.a. the vinegar or the, the bitterness that Christ had to partake before he died and uh, to, to uh, be resurrected with power. So this is Christ's per, uh, uh, Passover, right? This is his Passover. This is him uh, being sacrificed for he could come back with power and uh, give the children of Israel the ability to become sons and daughters of the Most High, which never die because they are like angels, right? But uh, that's a different story for, that's a different lesson for a different time. So let's go to Exodus 12. Nine. So we see the vinegar or the bitter herbs being introduced, which represented uh, the vinegar. So Exodus 12, 9. Okay, so you got the unleavened bread and uh, and Christ uh, was the unleavened bread, right? And Paul told them to put out the, put off the, uh, the leaven of their old works, the leaven of sin. So now we got the unleavened bread, which would represent Christ. Being remember, leaven represents sin, so unleavened meant uh, no sin, right? So, this represents uh, Christ being sinless, right? And him partaking of the even though he was this would be him being sinless, right? So, look, let's put it all together. Sorry, and they shall eat the flesh in that night, which is them devouring uh, the flesh of Christ, them killing. Uh, or them are uh, destroying the body, right? So them destroying the body, even though that body represented something sinless, a.k.a. unleavened bread, uh, a.k.a. Uh, from the herbage, right? From the Most High, uh, the blood of grapes and stuff, etc. But anyway, unleavened bread with bitter herbs, which represented the vinegar, because uh, vinegar had to be made through uh, the herbs, right? It had to be made uh, through the process of what fermenting, and etc. I believe that's how they made the vinegar. But uh, it represented how the bitter vinegar was. It represented the bitter herbs that they shall eat it, are Christ partaking of the bitter vinegar, right? So Exodus 12... Uh, nine. Now, this one right here, it was kind of hard, right? It was kind of hard. And let's see if we can make it all work now. Exodus 12, 9. Eat not of it raw, nor sun at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof, right? And let's see here. Uh, 
Let's see. Uh, my bad. Uh, I mean, I'm reading it in the King James Version. That's what makes more sense. And they should eat uh, the flesh in the night, roast with fire. And they should eat unleavened bread with bitter herbs. Okay. So we didn't need that. So now, Exodus 12 and 9. Ye shall not evil eat of it raw, nor sodden in water, but only roast with fire. The head with the feet and the uh, erpertensis. I'll say erpertensis. Erpertensis. So now, you shall not eat of it raw nor sodden in water, but only roasted in fire, right? So now, they can only partake of this lamb, right? Well, sorry, when it became time to partake of the flesh, right? When it came time to uh, partake of the the flesh of, of the body of this lamb, they cannot partake of it in water, but only roast it in fire, right? You should not eat of it raw, so they can eat it raw anyway, nor side in water, but only roast with fire, the head with the feet and the uh, upper tenacity. So now, that the people cannot partake of that lamb's body through the water. They can only partake of the lamb's body through the fire, right? They cannot partake it through the water, only through the fire. And my bad right here. Now, let me show y'all something first before we, uh, before I break that down, right? So the Exodus 12, uh, 8, right? The Exodus 12, 8, right? The unleavened bread. Let me just show y'all real fast. I know I hit on it, but let me show y'all real fast. Um, just in case. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8, right? Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out that old leaven, the old leaven, so purge out, get rid of the old leaven. This is what was going on in the feast. That ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, right? For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So now it actually tells you the Lord's Passover is Christ, right? Christ was the Passover. Christ's story represented the Passover. So Moses was trying to explain to them the point behind Christ's sacrifice. Christ was sacrificed for the sin, a.k.a. the children of Israel first, as well as for the rest of the world to get under the covenant. I know my Israel, only people don't like that, but that's another lesson anyway. For even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us, right? So the, the, the whole Passover thing, represented Christ. So we're just going into details. But understand that the people are unleavened, right? They become un unleavened when they put off the old leaven. When they when they get rid of the sin, uh when they get off when they get rid of the sin and the Holy Spirit come in, they become unleavened. And they partook of that and unleavened means no leaven, sinless. Christ was unleavened, so they partook of that sinless nature of Christ. But, uh, that was just that breakdown. So now we hit Exodus 12, 9, right? This was kind of hard, but I think we got, I think I got through it to break it down, right? So they could not uh, partake when they, when the Jews, right? Uh, sorry, when Israel killed the Passover lamb, right? They put the blood on the door. But when they partook of this body, that body could not be in water. It only could be in fire, right? 
So then we go to Matthew 3 and 11. This is John the Baptist. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. So John brought the water. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. So this is talking about the Christ. He was coming after John the Baptist. He was coming after the one that baptized with water. Whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So the lamb was the one that was going to bring in the spirit and fire, right? And then we know that fire represented judgment, right? But the Holy Spirit and with fire was coming from the lamb. So the lamb could not, when they partook of the lamb, right? The lamb they partook of could not be in water, right? It could not be in water. It had to be in fire. So you have the early mission of water baptized, of being baptized into water for repentance. But this lamb in the Passover, you couldn't baptize it in water and eat it. No, it had to go to the fire. And the fire came dealing with the Holy Spirit. That lamb was a partaker of the fire and of the, and of the Holy Spirit. So now, that's what's going on in Exodus 12, 9. Eat it not raw. Don't eat it how it is, right? You can't eat it. I'm oh, sorry, my bad. Let me go back to the step two again. Sorry. Eat it not, so you should not eat of it raw, okay? So you can't eat of it uh, how it is, right? The original state. You can't eat of it how it is. Nor siding in water. You can't eat of it uh, dealing with the remission, the water baptism. But only roast with fire. You can partake of it dealing with the nature of the fire that came out of the Holy Spirit. The head with the feet, the top and the bottom, right? This represent the whole body, the head and the feet, the top and the bottom, symbolically represents the beginning and the end, the whole body, right? It has to be roasted in fire. And the people who partook of it had to partake of this unleavened bread, had to partake of this lamb dealing with the end of the game, which was the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay, so now, hopefully that made sense. Exodus 12 and 10. Nothing shall be left out of it till the morning. So they can leave no pieces out till the morning. And a bone of it ye shall not break. But that which is left out of it till the morning, ye shall burn with fire. So no more of the original body was to be left over, right? The body could not be left out. Nothing, the body had to be uh, uh, disposed of. They could not leave the body out. They could not break a bone of the body, and they could not leave the body out, right? So now, let's go to John 19. 36. For the uh, John 19, 36. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. So now, you can go up here with 34. Uh, sorry. Uh, Start at 31, John 19, 31. 
The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on Sabbath day, so the bodies could not be left out. For the Sabbath day was a high day, holy day, but saw Pilate, that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forth came out there blood and water. So you can't partake of blood anyway, and the, and the lamb couldn't be washed in water. But it was unlawful for them to partake of blood anyway. But anyway, it's all uh, symbolism, right? Shows you the symbolism of what's going on. The mastermind of Yahweh, as well as and the Father. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knew that he said that he said true, that ye might believe. For all these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture said, they should look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he may take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. So you can see that the body was completely taken away. It wasn't left out till the morning, right? The, as soon as he died, a bone not broken, uh, he was taken away, right? A bone not broken, he was taken away. So this Exodus 12 and 10. So hopefully you can see uh, uh, how all of this story is actually about Christ and his sacrifice, right? And thus you shall eat it, your loins girded and your sandals on your feet and your staves in your hands, and you shall eat it in haste. It is a Passover to the Lord. It will, it's the Lord's story. That's what it is. And this is just for my uh, people that say that, uh, so that's the Passover, right? 100%. That was the Passover breakdown. That's one of them. We're going to do uh, another Passover breakdown, and we're going to do another Passover breakdown. So this is the overall uh, information of the story that was being told about Christ, all right? So now this is going to segue for the people who don't understand how to do the feast days or the, uh, the time period. The feast days represent uh, a time period of gathering, okay? Uh, it's not really about the food. The food was there to teach a, a, a story. But people just get feasts dealing with, with eating instead of a, a marker or a time period. But now, Exodus 34, 23, just for the people who don't understand about the feast days. Three times in a year shall every male of thine appear before the Lord, the God of Israel, should be Yahweh. So this is the first thing you got to do. Males, right? Three times in the year. Nobody's doing that today. For when I shall have, uh, and this is not, uh, you had to go to Jerusalem, okay? You, you can't do it in America. For when I shall cast out the nations before thy face and shall have enlarged thy coast, no one shall desire thy uh, no one shall desire thy land. It's the land of Canaan. Whenever thou mayest go up to appear before the Lord thy God three times a year, thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifices with leaven. So you have to do the sacrifices. It is a requirement. If Christ came to do away with the sacrifices, he have to do away with the feast because sacrifices was a requirement of the feast. Neither shall the sacrifices of the feast of Passover remain till the morning. And we see that already. So that tells about Christ. But you got to have sacrifices in the feast. If Christ came to do away with the sacrifices, by default, he had to do away with the feast because each feast 
had a sacrifice. So now, let's show also how it doesn't make sense that Christ came to do away with the sacrifices because we know sacrifices were still going on after Christ died, right? So once you go to Daniel 9, and let's look at the prophecy. Daniel 9, 27, right? And one week shall establish the covenant with many, and in the midst of the week, uh, my sacrifice and drink offering shall be taken away, right? So now, this happens after, and that shall understand it from the going forth of the command to the answer for the building of Jer Jerusalem until Christ the Prince uh, shall be seven weeks, uh, 16, at that time, of return, blah, blah, what is it there? And after 62 weeks, the anointed one shall be destroyed. And there is no judgment in him. So you got the anointed one destroyed after 62 weeks, right? So after the anointed one is destroyed, what's still going on? Sacrifices. Because on the, the midst of the 70th week, right? So you got uh, seven weeks here. Then you got 62 weeks here, right? Which is 69, right? And after the 62 weeks, which people can say it's the 69th week, the anointed one is cut off. So this is the end of Christ, right? But what's happening after Christ is destroyed? Sacrifices are still going on. So if Christ came to do away with the sacrifices, the sacrifices should have left up here, right? The sacrifices should have left up here. But the sacrifice left after Christ was destroyed. And he still called them my sacrifices, right? So the sacrifice leave left after Christ was destroyed. So if he came to do away with the sacrifices, they should have ceased up here. What Christ came to do away with was the old covenant, that whole old covenant system, which is the destruction of the city and the sanctuary. The whole old covenant system, only leaving the new covenant system that doesn't deal around temple uh, worship, a uh, physical temple. Now we are the temple, spiritual temple. But anyway, you can go to Daniel 11, 31. So for the uh, the citizens, this will be the Romans. Israel uh, shall come against him, right? And against the Holy Covenant. And seed shall spring up out, out of him. And they shall profane the sanctuary of strength. And they shall remove the perpetual sacrifice and make the abomination desolate. So you got the uh, sacrifice again left there after Rome come in, right? And then you got Daniel 12, 11. And from the time of the removal of the, of the perpetual sacrifice, when the abomination of desolation shall be set up, there shall be 1,290 days, right? So this sacrifice is actually after Christ is killed, right? So the sacrifice had to be taken away in order to show them the time wonder, right? And then we have the abomination of desolation uh, set up, and we see this in Matthew 24. Uh, what's the word? 15. And when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel prophet stand in the holy place, whosoever reader let him understand, then let them which are Judea flee to the mountains, right? So we know that this happened 70 AD when they fled into the mountains, right? And if you don't know, Luke called the abomination of desolation uh, the, the armies that caused the desolate or the desolation which dealt with the armies, right? So now, this which aka the Roman army. But the abomination of desolation happens during the time period in which they are still doing the daily sacrifices, and the daily sacrifices are taken away, placing in, bringing in the abomination of desolation. So this is 70 AD. This is about 40 years after Christ died. So if Christ came to do away with the sacrificial system, which they say he died around 30 AD, that means 40 years after Christ died, they were still doing the sacrificial system. So how could Christ come to do away with the sacrificial system when you still have the disciples, which had Paul do a Nazarite, uh, a Nazarite sacrifice 
which dealt with the offerings of a, which dealt with a sin offering, aka the killing of a, uh, I think it was a, uh, a lamb. Uh, it could have been the killing of a lamb, but regardless, it was an animal sacrifice. So Paul had to do an animal sacrifice with the Nazarene vow to show the Jews that he was still practicing the law. So how could Christ come to do away with the sacrificial system when the Holy Spirit inspired Jews had Paul partake of the sacrificial system? It doesn't make sense. And then we see that the sacrificial system works hand in hand with the feast days. So, I mean, none of it makes sense. It doesn't work. This is for the people who want to teach a continuation of the feast days, but not the sacrifices. You can't uh, do, you can't get rid of the sacrifices because the sacrifices was a point, a part of the feast days. The, in fact, in Exodus, we showed you that they were equivalent to the feast days. All the same thing, sacrifices, feast days. That Moses called, called both uh, 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 um, festivals, right? Are, are both occasions the same thing? Feast one, sacrifice the other one, service to God another, right? They're all the same thing. They mean the same thing. So you can't do away with the sacrifices without doing away with the feast days. You can't do away with the feast days without doing away with the sacrifices. You need it all to work. And then we just showed you how Christ did not come to do away with the feast days. I mean, sorry, Christ did not come to do away with the sacrificial system when. They were still doing sacrifices all the way up until the destruction of the temple, which was 40 years after Christ died, per se, according to some of the scholars. You know, we can name, we can play with that 40 years, not, uh, I believe it, but we can play with it if you want to. But regardless, the disciples required Paul to do a sacrifice. And that's after that they was, that's after they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul did a sacrifice after he was deal, filled with the Holy Spirit. So if Christ came to do away with the sacrificial system, why are the disciples and all of those followers still sacrificing? Because they had four people that was doing the Nazarene vow, if I recall, it was four. But, I mean, that number might be off, but I think it was four. But regardless, these people were following Christ. These people were following the disciples, but yet and still, they were still doing sin offerings and stuff inside of the temple. So, no, Christ did not come to do away with the sacrificial system. Christ came to do away with the whole old covenant, that which, which included the law of Moses and etc. Because he said, okay, now we're going to do with spiritual. We're going to condense all of the things. First of all, the feast days are all about my life. And we're going to go through each feast day to show you uh, how it was about Christ. Crisis judgment and all of that stuff. All it is is a break. It's a a representation, sim symbolism for what Christ came to do. His whole life, uh, his whole mission, is found within the feast days. All Christ's mission is found within those feast days. So, doing the feast days right now is you. Uh, they were doing the feast days to rem to tell the story about Christ's coming. So when he came, they were supposed to correlate, okay, this is what that meant, okay? You doing it today is redundant because it had already been fulfilled through Christ. See, that was the feast day was supposed to bring them to Christ. You don't have to be brought to Christ no more because he didn't came and gone. He wasn't, when they were doing the feast days, that it was bringing them to him. And when he got there, and after he, he died and resurrected with all power, it was like, oh, this is what all of that meant. But in order to stop the continuation, the Most High pretty much wiped out Jerusalem itself. So now uh, you have a different way of doing things, a.k.a. through the Spirit and through faith and all that stuff. But hope that all helped you out. This is just the first overlay. This is part A of the Passover. So... You can go to RPK, Resurrection, Prophecy, and Kingdom, where we concentrate on those three subjects, Resurrection, Prophecy, and Kingdom. This is going to be my feast day series in which we're going to concentrate on the feast days, right? So I would like to say thank you all for listening in.
uh, shalom to my brothers from RPK that's out there listening, as well as the brothers and sisters that's not part of RPK. Thank you all for listening. Please share the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, and hit the bell. Uh, I love you all, and we have more information that's going to come. Thank you, and have a blessed day.